I'm going to, I was, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Gold, I'm the immediate past president of the Division of Trauma Psychology. I assume you all know Dr. Laura Brown, uh, who is going to give the presidential address as the current president of the Division of Trauma Psychology, Division 56. Um, Laura has authorized me to divulge to you that there will be chocolate. Um, at the beginning of the business meeting, which is immediately following this meeting, so Laura is enough of a good behaviorist that she's holding off the reinforcer for the beginning of the business meeting. But I can also tell you that being a, a brilliant administrator, um, for those of you who have ever been to a business meeting before, this one will be infinitely more interesting and interactive than any you've ever been to before. So it will be worth the chocolate. Please stick around. Um, so let me go ahead um, and introduce Laura. I tried very hard in, in writing some introductory remarks to call her Dr. Brown, but we're just too close and she's just too human and down to earth for me to get used to calling her Dr. Brown. People who know her are, are nodding their heads. Um, and I've got to tell you that as honored as I am to introduce her, it, it turned out to be a very difficult task to condense for you briefly all the things that Dr. Brown has accomplished. She's authored over 130 publications. She's made over 250 presentations and invited addresses throughout the United States, as well as in Canada, Mexico, England, Scotland, the Netherlands, Belgium, Israel, or Taiwan. I'm trying to speak fast so I don't take too much time with the introduction. The cadre of psychologists who contributed to a single area of study, um, uh, as much as Dr. Brown has, is exceedingly small. As you know, the modal number of publications among psychologists is zero. But one of the features, <laughs> you do know that, right? One of the features that distinguishes her career is that she's made a major mark on not one or two areas, but several domains of psychology. She is, in my mind, first and foremost, a pioneer of feminist psychological theory and feminist therapy. Her book, Subversive Dialogues, Theory and Feminist Therapy, is a classic. Um, as recently as last year, she has an APA book called Feminist Therapy. Uh, the other night, when the Division of Trauma Psychology Executive Council met, um, incoming division president Terry Keene referred only partly in jest to Dr. Brown as the APA queen of diversity. Um, her perspective on feminism has long been that the eradication of sexism cannot be fully realized without addressing the oppression of all disenfranchised groups. Um, by the way, that's not a quote, that's a paraphrase. This conviction <laughs> is reflected, so I really did get it. This conviction <laughs> is reflected in, her, in the title of her co-authored volume, Diversity and Complexity in Feminist Therapy, and it's led her to become an expert in several areas of diversity. Um, she's developed and disseminated nuanced conceptualizations of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender issues, and of culture and ethnic diversity issues. The framework on diversity in its myriad forms delineated in her recently published APA book, Cultural Competence in Trauma Therapy Beyond the Flashback, is in my estimation nothing less than masterful and hopefully, hopefully destined to strongly impact thinking throughout the mental health professions about diversity. In addition, Dr. Brown has strongly influenced the guidelines for practice in trauma-informed forensic psychology, um, she obviously as, uh, would not be president of the Trauma Psychology Division if she hadn't made major contributions as well to the field of trauma psychology. Um, beyond her scholarly publications and presentations, she's been extremely active in leadership of psychology. She has an extensive history of leadership in APA. She's a member of 11 APA divisions and a fellow in nine of those divisions. She served as president of the Washington Psychological Association and three APA divisions, Division 35, Psychology of Women, Division 44, Society for Psychological Study of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transsexual Issues, and currently, again, president of the Division of Trauma Psychology. Um, she's also, I'm, I'm going to cut this, but she has been active in so many other divisions in the leadership, I just don't have time because we're cutting to her talk time.
So and in has been very active in a number of organizations outside of APA. And if those activities did not reflect sufficient breadth, she also spent several months in Australia working as a consultant for the TV series Surviving. <laughs> <laughs> has authored a mystery novel. She obviously possesses a keen, wide-ranging, and prolific intellect, but the common denominator that ties together her extensive endeavors in all of these fields is not merely her intellectual prowess, but a generous heart and a deep spiritual presence that fuel her passionate dedication to social justice, the topic of her address today. Laura came of age in the 1960s, a time of radical social upheaval and transformation to, to a degree that is true of exceptionally few in that, our generational cohort. Over the intervening years, she's never lost her youthful idealism, energy, and commitment to social activism. Um, she certainly has, however, evolved, continually honing her skill in designing and implementing strategies for effectively promoting social change. It's a great honor to introduce to you an outstanding figure in our profession, the president of the APA Division of Trauma Psychology, and someone who I am privileged to call a friend. Thank you. 
As a society, we're sometimes shocked when a trauma survivor throws off her or his cloak of invisibility. And the shock is as much that she or he took off the cloak as that there's a history of trauma present in this person, particularly when the person is high-functioning, respected, and well-liked. And we know this, and then we repress that knowledge. When I occasionally remind people in conversation that Oprah Winfrey is among the dwellers of the invisible world, and that her well-documented life story of early unwanted pregnancy, struggling with food and body, and keeping marriage at bay, and using work as a coping strategy are all familiar themes from one set of trauma survivors, people act shocked, as if they're hearing for the first time this well-publicized bit of information about America's richest and most powerful woman. Despite society's best efforts at making trauma invisible and marginal, it's deep in the history of being human. When you read the epics and sacred texts of every civilization or listen to the tales of those cultures that commit stories to memory rather than to stone or clay or paper, we learn of battles, death and destruction, of violence and violation. We see the forms of human distress that today are codified as PTSD. When we read the prophet Ezekiel's description of having a heart of stone, or Homer's telling of Achilles' intrusive images of his beloved dead Patroclus, we see the ruins of Pompeii, the abandoned cliff dwellings of the Anasazi people. We read the stories of the plague, the great fire of London, the Lisbon earthquake. We encounter in these tales the stories of rape, of beatings, of hate crimes committed in the name of a divine being for millennia. And we know that trauma and its biopsychosocial and existential aftermaths have been with us as a species always. Earlier humans seem to be more willing or able to speak some of the truth of trauma. But in our hyper-controlled modern age, although the messiness that comes from the emotional and physical and other aspects of the aftermath of events that are traumatizing is a terrible reminder that we are in fact not in control. So perhaps the stigmata associated with having been traumatized and thus lost the illusion of control have gone greater. Trauma is also the spore of the monster of social injustice. War, genocide, interpersonal violence, and the abuse of power, poverty, bias, all of these things and more which constitute the rotten foundations of the invisible world are the evidence that the invisible world is not as just as it pretends to be. The irony, of course, is that we wish to believe in the justice and goodness of the world and the people in it. So much so that one of the marks of a traumatizing event is, as Ronnie Janoff Bowman described, the explosion of our belief in a just world, no matter how illusory such a world might be. Human beings have scores of faith traditions built around explications of the world's injustice, most of which imply that if we weren't so badly behaved, so impulsive, so self-indulgent, so unwilling to forego pleasure, the world would indeed be just. So we cling to that illusion that the world is just, and we pretend that the stink of the monster of social injustice isn't in our nostrils. Because I've been privileged, and let me see if my PowerPoint, ah oh yes, here we are, PowerPoint. <laughs> ah, oops, take that one back. <laughs> Preview of coming statement. I'm privileged to know so many people who've lived through trauma, not just clients, but friends and family. I know its pervasiveness, its presence in the world that surrounds me. That hidden invisible world walks my streets, peers at me from windows, glares from the television screen. It's a world I enter voluntarily every day because I know, as many of you do, that even if we pretend not to enter that invisible world, we're swimming in it, surrounded by it. Better to see, feel, hear, and acknowledge it willingly and mindfully because in so doing, we take into our hands the power to transform that world. So I start with the story of traveling by accident into the invisible world of trauma because it, illustrate, it illustrates how the topics of trauma and social justice are joined at the root in my life. When people ask me, how do I tolerate doing this work? I say that I come from the Jewish tradition that says that to save one life <coughs> is to save the entire world, and that I have had the privilege of saving the world one life at a time. Recently, though, I've done a lot of thinking about this whole connection between social justice and trauma psychology. Some of this has to do with the existential dilemmas of midlife. Like, what is the meaning of what I do? Of what use am I on this planet? 
Does any of this matter very much? Am I really helping to create justice? My answers trouble me. When I first became involved in the movements to stop sexual abuse and assault, I had the usefully optimistic belief that if we told the truth about what was happening to people, the world would respond with outrage and the abuse of children would come to an end. <laughs> I never predicted that the world would respond to our truth telling by cooking up the false memory movement. I did not think that our social justice movement to stop violence against human beings and bear witness to the emotional scars left by such violence would become subsumed by the mainstreams of institutions of mental health, which would then stigmatize the psychological sequelae of those confusing, terrifying experiences of betrayal and violation. I didn't think that the veterans of yet another war would come home to find their combat trauma referred to by the government as pre-existing conditions with which they would then be denied access to the benefits and services that they needed so much. I couldn't imagine that hurricanes would be followed by disasters of governmental neglect. I certainly didn't think that three plus decades on, I would still be seeing people coming into my office whose experiences of childhood trauma and then being ignored and punished when they cried out for help happened well after I and all of us began our quest for justice for those so targeted as children. I didn't want us to need a division of trauma psychology. So how things turned out almost 40 years after I started has been the source of some rude awakenings recently. The more I ponder these questions about the meaning and value of my life's work, the more I found myself staring at some unpleasant facts. And thus, the more I wanted to share them with you so that we can respond to those facts together. So here's my unpleasant fact. The field of trauma psychology, our field, requires the presence of social injustice for us to exist. That's a problem. That's a fact about which we need to do something because we need more justice. Because look around us. We're the specialists in the study and treatment of the effects of injustice, combat, genocide, torture, sexual assault, physical and sexual abuse and neglect, sexual abuse by clergy, hate crimes, discrimination, microaggression. Even the disaster psychology among us, experts among us rarely get to work with trauma survivors who haven't also been traumatized by human bad behavior. Because after all, Katrina was not about a hurricane. It was about the neglect of the government to keep the levees going and the neglect of the government to prepare to rescue the poorest and most vulnerable of citizens of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. Many of the disasters we see aren't just something going wrong. There's something going wrong because a human being failed to pay attention. The unavoidable fact is that most of us in the room make our living because there is injustice. Without injustice, we would wither away as a field. There will likely always be truly natural disasters, vehicle accidents, traumatic illnesses and injuries that would require our study or care. But the bulk of what most of us do is because there's injustice in every corner of the planet. That little line in the DSM description about trauma being worse than what it is or appears to be a human design, well, if you look carefully, the hands of humans are in almost every trauma. And many of those humans aren't the innocent other driver who hit a patch of black ice and their car drove into us. They're humans who are abusing their power, their privilege, their role, acting indifferently, behaving with a notable absence of justice. We also know that from this traumagenic exposure to injustice usually flows further injustice for the traumatized individual. While I was struggling to write this talk, I spent an afternoon in one of our prisons interviewing a man who I'll call Dave Green. Um, Dave's been living in our state's Department of Corrections for um, the, almost half of his life, starting when he was age 17. He killed a man who sexually abused him. Fact about his murder victim that he could not bring to consciousness until he'd been in prison for many years. He had been in the control of one state agency or another since being removed around age eight from the control of his biological parents, who sadistically abused him and his siblings. The state agencies that deal with abused children are chronically underfunded and their staff, even when caring, frequently change because their pay is low and their work painful. So as he bounced from one foster placement to another, including a few where he was abused again, there was no one around to pay attention to his downward spiral. His last case was buddies with the murder victim, 
And when Dave cried out to that caseworker and said, I'm being sexually assaulted, the caseworker said, you're making that up. You're confused. You must be misunderstanding what he's doing. So when Dave killed this man and was assigned a public defender who spent almost no time on his case, the narrative of what had happened to him as a survivor of trauma never came forward. And so injustice was added to injustice, and he got sent to prison for basically the rest of his life. With the exception of the man he killed, no one else who ever abused or harmed or neglected Mr. Green is free and walking, rather everyone else who did this to him is free and walking around the world. His biological parents served very short prison terms for the truly horrendous things that they did to him. Things that gave me nightmares for a week after I heard about them. The other foster parents who abused him never spent a moment in custody. The caseworker who ignored his cries for help kept his job. Injustice piled on injustice piled on injustice. Now the story sounds extreme because most of the trauma survivors with whom we work don't face a lifetime in prison because of the concatenation of injustices emerging from their initial trauma exposure. They may become permanently ill from living in a toxic FEMA trailer, are underemployed because of flashbacks and nightmares from childhood complex trauma. They may lose custody of their children because their ability to parent has been impaired and undermined or lose access to veterans' benefits because their PTSD led to acting out behaviors and an other than honorable discharge. They might be sleeping under a bridge because of the self-hatred and substance abuse that developed after sexual abuse by a priest. All of these spirals from injustice to injustice to injustice are painful and terrible ones. To say that Dave Green, with his extreme response, is having an extreme experience only underscores that for many trauma survivors, the spirals of injustice range on a continuum from terrible to extreme. We make our livings because there is injustice. But there may be justice, though. The rest of Dave Green's story is a story of the pursuit of justice. One psychologist bore witness to his life. A friend of mine who conducted the first psychological evaluation on him for my state's Department of Children's Services read the media stories about the murder and attempted to come forward, tried to convince his not very good attorney to bring her testimony forward to do mitigation. When that didn't happen, she didn't just shut up and go away. She began to visit him in prison. And it was in her presence, in a prison visiting room, that his memories of the sexual abuse first began to emerge. It was through her efforts that a really good criminal defense attorney agreed to take the case for his appeal pro bono, and through her persistence that I ended up at that prison a couple of months ago listening to his trauma story. She stayed with him when he has flashbacks and nightmares, and in our state prison system, it is forbidden to treat men with PTSD today. She takes his collect calls from prison so that he's not alone behind those walls with flashbacks and nightmares. She has sought justice for him. Now some of you may listen to what I'm telling you about what my friend and colleague has done and say, start thinking, but what about dual roles? What about ethics? After all, her original client wasn't him, it was the State Department of Children's Services. What is she doing visiting him in prison, taking those calls? I'd like to argue that what my friend is doing is behaving with the highest possible ethic. She's modeling what I would like to describe today as an ethic of justice in trauma psychology. The ethic of pursuing justice where there has been none as a foundational value for trauma psychology is what I'm going to spend the rest of this afternoon talking about. This ethic of so creating social justice is one that dictates that the psychologist's task is to bear witness and to continue to bear witness until such time as justice has been more served. My challenge to all of us, how can we create an ethic of trauma psychology in which our actions, large and small, expose the injustices inherent in the invisible world of trauma, and which our actions create justice whenever and wherever possible, is what I want to invite you all to participate in today. Such an ethic of creating justice as a foundation for the field of trauma psychology is founded in a collective recognition that our life's work only exists because of injustice. 
and only that by telling the truth about that injustice, in all that we do, will we cease to be accidental, and accidental enablers of that injustice. Advocating for an ethic of justice in trauma psychology seems to me to be a way to respond to the reality that our field sits on that foundation of injustice. Now, having a justice, justice ethic isn't a new idea. Lots of us don't buy clothing that we know is made in sweatshops or food grown under conditions of oppression. Lots of us started boycotting grapes and iceberg lettuce back in the 60s, and some of us will only buy food today if it's got a fair trade label on it. But do we question that our own livelihoods depend on the realities of injustice, underlying trauma? No one in this room is a silent bystander to trauma. You're all here today because we're willing to see it and engage with it. So what I'm hoping you'll leave with today is a heightened purpose not only to see trauma, but also to see and call by name the injustices that underlie it and create it, thus considering how we may set our field on a path to obsolescence, although sadly, we will not see that obsolescence in our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes. So let me talk about the components of an ethic of trauma practice as I'm beginning to envision them. This is very preliminary work. These are aspirational, not enforceable, and not terrifically different from some of the bedrock aspirational principles of other social justice ethics that many of us are already attracted to. They reflect to some degree a, a reordering of the usual ranking of aspirational principles because this justice-focused focused ethic does not begin with avoiding harm or it simply with even doing good. Instead, this is an action ethic Sedek Tirdof, in the words of the Torah, to run after justice. So, the first component, tell the truth about the link between injustice and trauma, and do what is possible to make that truth visible, audible, palpable, and known everywhere that we can. This will not be simply done. Many of us work in systems and institutions that would like to construct PTSD and the other forms of trauma-related distress as simply one more form of psychopathology to be categorized and dealt with. It's essential to all of us that trauma psychologists remain a visible presence and credible voice in those settings, particularly in the formal institutions of power and authority of society. We gain much as a field and as a culture because there are trauma psychologists in hospitals, in prisons, and universities, working with law enforcement and in the military. There's also the ever-present risk, though, that any of us, whether in the apparently less fettered world of independent practice or the administratively rich world of a quasi-military system, that that person becomes institutionalized in the system. And this is certainly true for me. After all, when I work with a client who's living with the wages of injustice, known as complex trauma, and I'm billing to an insurance company, I have to put down a diagnosis, and therefore I have to ascribe pathology to that person, rather than to ascribe pathology to the culture and context that wounded them. So no matter how many times I get to proclaim in my writings or speeches that I believe that the pathology lies outside the person, and that only the distress and the behavioral dysfunction is what is with the person, the seductive nature of repeatedly calling something pathological on paper has to be having its effects on me. For all of us, the ethic of naming injustices omnipresence in the work of trauma psychology, the making visible of that invisible, can be a challenge. So how might we fulfill this first component of a justice ethic in trauma psychology? I'd like to suggest that we do this aspect of treat, speaking the truth about injustice through the ways in which we frame our work day to day. So for instance, in addition to the question for therapists, what's the most effective treatment I can offer? Add the questions, what can I offer that will lead to the most justice for this person? In addition to thinking about the symptoms manifested by the person we're treating, we must think, of, we must think about the ways in which that person might have a more just world available to them through the ways in which we invite them to understand their trauma responses. We're writing the syllabus for our courses in trauma psychology, in addition to ensuring that we have the best texts with the most current research and the most founded evidence basis for practice. We must also be sure to include the history of the cultural and societal realities of oppression and injustice that create the contexts in which trauma has been born. 
Now, we were thrilled as a division when Time Magazine named Edna Foa, to whom we gave our Lifetime Achievement Award last night, one of its 100 most influential people because of her development of prolonged exposure therapy for PTSD, which has helped so many people suffering to diminish. And at the same time, we need to tell the truth about the circumstances that led time to focus on Dr. Foa. To quote from the University of Pennsylvania's press release about her honor, the recent dramatic increase of PTSD sufferers in the US and around the world, following increased terror attacks in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, has resulted in the urgent need to disseminate Dr. Foa's treatment for PTSD to mental health professionals. So the truth about why a trauma psychologist finally made the time list of 100 is that there's been a dramatic increase in injustice. We're in the middle of two terrible wars. One of them in Afghanistan began as a war of self-defense against the people who perpetrated the September 11th attacks, themselves a recent incident of justice. But the other war in Iraq, I would argue, and I know many people would agree, happened because a series of lies and deceptions perpetrated on the Congress of the US because of the personal agendas of a few powerful people and the willingness of those people to be willfully ignorant when the truth became available to them. I do not think that hyperbole to say that the men and women who served and sometimes through multiple deployments in Iraq were betrayed by the leadership of the US government at its very highest levels. I was an intern in the VA just a few years after the last time our government betrayed its military, also known as the War in Vietnam. We were seeing the first few Vietnam veterans in the VA then, and we couldn't say that they'd been traumatized. Of course, we didn't have a diagnosis of PTSD, but we had to officially say that they were characterologically disordered, because to speak the truth, that they had been press ganged and then betrayed by their government wasn't the thing we were allowed to say back then. Standing up to say, as psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, and other mental health professionals did, that the problems that these men, and it was mostly men and a few women had, was not because they had pre-existing conditions, because they had been exposed to trauma, to, to combat, and then betrayed by their country. Standing up to speak that truth was not very popular, but it was an example of the ethic of justice in trauma psychology. And in fact, if we look at the work of the many distinguished <coughs> colleagues who are sitting with us in this room today, they just became distinguished not because they did the groundbreaking research or developed the best test or implemented the most effective treatment. They became distinguished as trauma psychologists because in their work, they have practiced this ethic of speaking the truth about injustice that underlies trauma. Their work has stood out from the crowd and stood the test of time because that work has said directly and clearly that most forms of trauma are human rights violations, that they're about abuses of power. That work is distinguished because it practices this first ethic of social justice in trauma psychology. Now sometimes we have to practice this ethic quietly, in our own minds, because if we're to do the next piece of the ethic, which is to bear witness, we have to be present with the trauma survivors to bear that witness. Sometimes those of us who are members of the sisterhood and brotherhood of survivors must remain silent as to our membership so that our ability to be credible and powerful of those who suffer must be preserved. We must live with injustice that labels trauma survivors as less sane, smart, and capable than those of us who have not experienced trauma. Being thoughtful, careful, and quiet does not mean that we should abandon this first ethic of trauma practice, however. We must instead find ways to ask ourselves how our work will allow others to see the invisible world, how the ways in which we ask our research questions, develop our treatments, teach our students, and frame our policy will speak the truth and expose the realities of social injustice woven into the narrative of trauma at every point that we possibly can. Sometimes this can be as simple as the studies we cite on the way to our description of our methodologies. A justice-informed literature review does not simply offer a precis of the research that has gone before. It also embeds in the narrative references to the social conditions creating the context of the traumas we comment upon. Sometimes this ethic of speaking the truth can be as simple as being dedicated to cultural competence. 
in the work that we do so that we don't create new injustices. A justice-informed approach to psychotherapy or research or teaching which simply asks the psychologist to integrate knowledge of social injustice into what we bring to our work and not replicate dynamics of oppression in that work makes the injustices underlying trauma more apparent because they're being placed in contrast to our attempts to create justice in the consulting room or the research lab or the classroom. Sometimes this can be as simple as asking your state psychological association to lobby for a bill that gives more choices of therapists to impoverished victims of crimes, something we did successfully this year in Washington State with some of my trainees, when I was in the room, Nicole, where are you? Uh, uh, went and lobbied for that bill, and we changed realities for those victims of crime who were having their choices taken away from them. You don't have to stand up and shout that injustice is the bedrock of trauma. You just have to keep noticing it and keep asking yourself, how do I keep this fact in front of me, informing my choices, my strategy, my work? How do I keep it in front of me and not reduce what I'm doing to symptom reduction or getting results at P less than 0.05? You have to be willing not to passively take the side of the perpetrator, which as Judy Herman notes, is usually the easiest thing to do. And what we do by accident and without intention, when we do not, on purpose and with intention, stand by the side of those targeted by injustice and tell the truth about the presence of injustice. Which leads me to the second principle of ethic of justice and trauma psychology, the ethic of witness. Being in relationship with and witnessing the experiences of trauma survivors is my second proposed component of an ethic of justice and trauma psychology. We need not to look away. People who have no homes, no ability to politely contain the horrors within them, or live in the correction system like Dave Green and so many other survivors of trauma, represent easy examples of survivors from whom we draw ourselves back as people and as cultures. Yet in many other ways, most of us distance ourselves from the realities of trauma embedded and embodied in trauma survivors. We pretend that we know their lives only from the safe distance, the therapist's chair, the researcher's lab. We speak of trauma as something out there, trauma survivors in the third person plural. An ethic of speaking the truth about injustice requires us to speak the truth about the omnipresence of trauma and its survivors. We are here in the room today, and I say we, because the empirical research that's been done teaches us that a third of psychologists are survivors of childhood trauma. Others of us are refugees, have lived in combat, survived domestic violence or sexual harassment or hate crime. We are very careful, we trauma survivors in the field of trauma psychology, not to witness one another or to be witnessed ourselves in these gatherings of the experts. Yet I wager that if I asked any one of us who have met the monsters of injustice personally to stand up at your seats, more of the people in the room would be on their feet than in their chairs. I'm not going to ask you to do that today because I'm not going to ask a room full of people strange to each other to violate their own privacy. But I, I am going to ask you to start thinking about the fact that when we begin to speak of trauma survivors as we and not they, we create witness which creates justice by telling the truth of the normalcy, the quotidian nature, the very pervasiveness of the invisible world of trauma. In this regard, I find myself informed by the Jewish traditions from which I come. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, we collectively confess to our failures of decency. In the first person plural, we tone, we intone, ashamnu, bagadnu, we have trespassed, we have betrayed trust. Despite knowing that most of the things in the list accurately describe no one in the room. The rabbis who created this prayer said that by listing all of these failures of good behavior collectively, we create the space for those of us who have engaged in them to come forward and truly make an amends. We take the shame away. We say, this is about us. Thus, in speaking about us, trauma survivors, we bear witness to the ordinariness, the pervasiveness of this experience. We create a room and space in the room for ourselves and you and me and us 
We allow you and us to be seen as all of who you and us are, not simply, simply you and your wounds, but us and our encounters with injustice. We take this simple step. We enact the ethical stance of witnessing and being in relationship in a very basic way that then allows us to reconsider how we might do this for the rest of our lives. The concept of risking connection developed by Laurie Perlman and Kasoff Pitney embodies this ethic of witness as a force for justice and trauma psychology. To witness and thus make visible, audible, and palpable the injustices inherent in trauma, we must risk being in relationship with its survivors. It's too easy to let our professional socialization to otherize suffering people get in the way of, general, of, uh, of genuine witness. There's a lot of ways to enact witness, and because I don't have a lot of time today, I'm not going to go through them. I'm going to have this talk published on the division website. Um, but I think that in my friend who championed Dave Green, we see a good example of how to enact a witness, uh, an, an ethic of witness. Enacting the ethical pr principle of witness requires that we notice and then ask ourselves how we can cease to distance and ceasing to distance is another really important part of the ethic of social justice. So I want to talk about the third and fourth pieces before I run out of time. It's amazing how you give me an hour and I still don't have enough time. So the third principle of an ethic of justice, of pursuing justice in trauma psychology, is a stance of humility and ignorance. This is one of the hardest ethical constructs to enact because being trained in a doctoral profession encourages neither of these ways of being. <laughs> and yet some of the best, most justice-promoting work that I know of in our field is developed by trauma psychologists who practice this ethic and this ethical stance. Catherine Norsworthy, who is the chair of our national <coughs> committee, practices this ethic in her work with refugees on the thai Burmese border. Just before I came out here, I read Carl Auerbach's uh, proposal for a Fulbright grant for the work that he's going to do in Rwanda that practices the ethic of listening to people about what they can teach us <coughs> as trauma psychologists about how to do our work. Practicing an ethic of humility and ignorance means that we say to the survivors of trauma, you are our teachers, you are our experts, and by listening to you carefully enough, to be taught by you, we listen to the injustices that have been done by you, to you rather. If I wish to avoid the kind of injustice that's intellectual colonialism and the abuse of the power of my role as a member of the cultural and intellectual elite, and rather enact a stance of humility and ignorance, I have to continually remind myself that if I witness and act informed by what I've learned, I will be most likely to develop practices that alleviate suffering and increase justice. So last, there is an ethic of action. I'm going to be 58 the last week of this year, and I no longer harbor illusions about my ability to change the world. But an ethic of justice for trauma psychology requires that we refuse to be swept into the trance of despair and helplessness that's so pervasive among us when we realize that our youthful utopian visions of transformation will not be achievable in our lifetime. When we see through the illusions of our youthful grandiosity, it's tempting to run into the arms of hedonism and passivity, disclaiming the responsibility for the world if we cannot control it. If we land in that place of despair, masquerading as indulgence, we will have empowered injustice, just as surely as if we went out and practiced it actively ourselves. Now, taking action is a very personal thing. How we act and where are not things that I'm going to prescribe to you. Many of you are already taking action, and not necessarily because you thought of it as an ethical imperative, but because you could see no other reasonable choices to make once you've witnessed injustice. Taking action towards justice can be frustrating, discouraging, confusing, and it can be very sweet. So I want to remind you palpably about the sweetness of justice and encourage you all to consider, rating, consider incorporating an ethic of justice into your work by ending today with a little ritual that comes from the Ashkenazic Jewish custom of giving candy and other sweets to children embarking on their religious education. This creates a classically conditioned relationship between <laughs> learning and the education, which obviously worked for me. I believe when we enact these four ethical stances, telling the truth, 
witnessing humility in action, we not only create more justice in the world and balance out the reality that our work is founded in the presence of justice, we also do something that sweetens our lives. So at the back of the room, my wonderful trainees are going to be offering you plates with little bits and shards of chocolate from the Theo Chocolate Company. Theo Chocolate. <laughs> um, most, most, most chocolate that you eat comes to you from exploitation. The chocolate you're about to taste is just chocolate. It is oppression free. Theo is the only chocolate roaster in the United States that is organic and fair trade, that does not oppress its workers. Its factory is a block from my office. <laughs> yeah. So I get to smell the sweet smells of the chocolate roasting and being rolled out as I walk home from work. When you taste this chocolate, I want you to be reminded that the pursuit of justice can be very sweet indeed, as sweet as these two excellent single origin, high hemp content cacao, high grade, high oxygen chocolates can be. <laughs> Chocolate comforts me, and it's good for me. So trauma psychologists have the privilege of being able to see, hear, and know the truth about the world. However we arrived here, accidentally on purpose, we've been honored to have become residents of the invisible world. We've been troubled, and yet we have been transmuted and refined, like gold in the alchemist pots, by our witness to the injustice that pervades human life. Our field, wonderfully and tragically, stands at the brink of an explosion of knowledge and influence. If we can embrace an ethic of creating justice through the work of trauma psychology, then the tragedy of injustice that is trauma can become redeemed through the sweetness of justice that will emerge in our work. Thank you.